welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. For years, right here in Union Square, hundreds of thousands of people have come together to fight for their rights. From civil rights to marriage rights, citizens of New York City have been at the forefront of activism for hundreds of years. There is a tremendous tradition of activism in New York City, dating back to the 1600s. Activists who are pushing for an expansion of individual liberty, and on the other hand, people who are interested in promoting the public good. New York City in the beginning was a slave city. 25% of the population were African slaves, some of the first activist protest movements were slave insurrections. This was a major headquarters with Boston pushing for abolition first in New York City uh, and then uh, in the South. In uh, 1854, 100 years before Rosa Parks had her encounter with the bus, Elizabeth Jennings in New York City refused to get on a colored only streetcar. The National Association of the Advancement of Colored People was in fact rooted here in New York in Harlem. So there was an enormous support system that existed in, uh, in New York City. New York City is the biggest port in the United States for a couple of hundred years. More than that, it is the point of entry for things coming from Europe, the flow of capital, the flow of commodities, the flow of culture, the flow of ideas about proper ways of organizing society, and particularly of interest here, immigrants. They come and they create massive enclaves there's been a long tradition of, you know, English uh, Owenites, of German socialists, of Irish uh, nationalists, of uh, Parisian communards, of Russian revolutionaries, of Jewish Bundists that have entered here. The exhibition where we're standing, Activists New York, is really about one of the defining qualities of New York City, which is its history of New Yorkers having opinions, getting in your face, and working to make the world a better place. It's not just a story of the past. We may talk about the role of New York and New Yorkers in the historic March on Washington in 1963, or we may talk about the garment workers strike in 1909, or the women's suffrage movement. But we've worked in the gallery to connect what's happening today in New York to that continuing history of activism. A lot of national movements that we might not naturally associate with New York actually have very important roots here because New York is not only a dense, diverse place where lots of ideas are in the mix, but it's also the national center of media and it's also America's capital of capital. It's a place to come raise money. New Yorkers have become famously outspoken and that tolerance of what might be considered deviant elsewhere has opened huge opportunities for New York to become really the cauldron in which social movements have been born. One of the things that people love most I think about history is being able to stand on the spot where something took place. Today we're presenting a walking tour of activism in East Harlem in collaboration with the Gotham Center at City University. We love to be able to curate and tell the stories of the city, both inside our walls and outside in the city. This is Terrence Cardinal Cook Healthcare Center. Uh, before that, it was Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital. In the history of East Harlem, there are so many groups who have been active activists, from the Irish to the Jews to the Italians to the, more recently the Puerto Ricans, African Americans, Mexicans. East Harlem historically has been a, an immigrant neighborhood, a working class, poor neighborhood. Um, you usually find the greatest activism among people who don't have very much. New York is such a wonderful city and such a rich city and there are stories that are, can be told forever. 
Uh, but the more people know, the more stories people know, the more they'll appreciate the city that they're visiting or living in. We want to open people's eyes to the rich history of activism. We want them to consider how people of past generations have looked at the world, looked at what they thought was wrong with the world, how they defined a good society, and how they chose to take action. When you look at this total of it, the battles over uh, race, over gender, over sexuality, over ethnicity, over public space, over social entitlements, there's a reason that at the same time New York is understood to be the center of capital, the center of power, the center of the empire, it's also been the center of, yes, activist resistance to that status quo. And today at CUNY, activism is alive and well. Nashua El Sayed was kidnapped by her father when she was only two and a half years old and spent 17 years in Egypt. Her story, an extraordinary escape, make her one very inspiring activist. I was born here in New York in, in, in September 1990 to an Egyptian father and a Puerto Rican mother. Uh, two and a half years after I was born, there was a divorce, which included my father kidnapping me from the United States to Egypt. The FBI located Nashua, but because of differing laws on child custody between the two countries, Nashua could not be rescued. He had threatened her that if she would come and take me or visit me, that he would do something to her. And of course, she was very terrified of that. Her father told her that her mother was dead, and she spent the next 17 years in Egypt. She describes this time as physically and psychologically abusive. Everything had a punishment, everything was a mistake, so I lived my life just trying to go through the day without making him angry. Nashua's father eventually agreed to a visit from her mother after being convinced by a family friend. Nashua was nine years old. I asked my dad, you know, who's this? And he said, this is your mother. And, w and without, like, you know, questioning or, or doubting, I just, I ran into her arms and, like, I knew it was her. You know, even though I couldn't speak the language and she couldn't speak mine, but it seemed like we talked for hours. And um, it was just the most exciting thing because that was it. Like, that was, you know, the hope that I needed, that my abusive life is not all I have. There's more out there, so. I taught myself English, and, uh, like, I began to, to speak to her and to learn about my culture. And she told me that I was American and I'm not just Egyptian, that I come from a place where I have options. I have the option to study what I want, be whom I want. I am powerful because I'm a woman. I don't have to be abused. I don't have to be forced into marriage. In my last year of, of high school, my father came into my room and told me that he had found me a husband and that I would be married that summer after graduation. Nashua's mother reached out to the FBI and informed them that her daughter was considering suicide rather than being forced into an arranged marriage. The FBI came up with a plan to rescue her. So at five in the morning, I prayed and I put on my shoes, my t-shirt, my jeans and my hijab and I ran outside of the door. And the van came and they slowed down. They took me in and they kept driving. Nashua enrolled in Queens College and later received a full fencing scholarship. While in school, she also established the Kitab Club, an after-school language program for immigrant children. And she founded the Syria Project, a program aimed at helping recent Syrian refugees integrate into the community. While majoring in international politics, she met Professor Mark Rosenblum, a renowned Middle East expert who became her mentor. I knew that this was not just a special biography, not just a riveting narrative. It was a life that was 
maybe once or twice in a lifetime you'll meet a person with this experience with the tenacity of overcoming. He became the father that I've never had. He is always the one that I, that I turn to in terms of advice. When I was 13, I told my dad, I want to study political science. I think this is my niche. His answer was, politics is for men. After majoring in international politics, Nasha became a student activist for the Ibrahim Leadership and Dialogue Project. This is a program that a Muslim American businessman and his son started after 9-11 when they lost some loved ones and most importantly felt their religion, Islam, had been hijacked. Then their statement was bringing in the best and brightest young student scholars of interfaith America to be ambassadors of the United States. We went to Washington for two days, then we went to Oman, to Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. I think the trip was a very intense particularly intense experience for her. She felt like she was back in Egypt, and she, I think, found herself suddenly liberated. And we would meet, uh, you know, high officials, and we get to interact and ask questions. We all came out wanting to make a difference in this area and make a difference in our home as well to introduce the Middle East in like a different form, that it's not just guns and violence and conflict. There's also art, history, and the people themselves are very different than what we see in the media. What happens afterwards? Goodbye, see you later? No. They have to talk about the impact of the experience and have a sort of a contract with each other and with me and the Ibrahim family that they would continue their work in specific ways the year after. I want to form a for-profit company in the Middle East that would put back into the community by teaching women skills like leadership, organization, you know, how to start a nonprofit, how to tackle issues in your community. Nashua now works for the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding. It gives me a way to show other students our power as youth. The center recently gave Nashua the award for uncommon courage. I'd say Nashua is on the way to being a very gifted advocate of her cause when it comes to abductions and trafficking of women in the Middle East, on the cause of Israeli-Palestinian peace, on all of the things that she believes strongly in. And she's wise beyond her age because she had choices to make, to stand still, to quit, or to bloom. And she's done the latter. A lot of people have approached me saying that my story has inspired, you know, change in them. And that's all that matters, honestly. And if I don't change a whole society, I might change one person. And, and for that, it's worth it. If you think undeveloped real estate is at a premium in New York City, aha, think again. Some people are looking up, way up, to the rooftops of the five boroughs on a quest for an eco-friendly New York. In New York City, eight million people live within five square miles. It is the definition of the urban jungle. One of the interesting things about New York City is it's such a built environment and the human impact on New York City is so overwhelming and so visible. It's so important that we here in New York think about our impact on the world and our ecological footprint. And that's an issue that matters to all of us, but it particularly matters to youth because they're here now, but they're going to be here long after we're gone. I think that kids are really looking for a way to make a difference and to have a meaningful impact on their worlds. To that end, Rebecca and the CUNY Center for Urban Environmental Reform is helping young people connect with Global Kids, where they are working to create more green space in the city. Global Kids has a program called the Human Rights Activist Project that goes on in several New York City high schools after school. In the Human Rights Activist Project, young people identify issues that are going on in their community that they find important and they would like to make change around. In this particular case, 
Green roofs was the topic that our young people around the city wanted to focus on as an issue. We, we've been checking out different sites that have rooftop gardens. A green roof or a green farm is positive to the community around it or, or the society around it in many ways. It first of all acts as a carbon sink, it helps block the sounds around it, it acts as a beautification site, and also it provides a fresh source of food for not only the people living in the building but also for the community around it. Green farm can just do so much for the environment that, that'll make my life extend even longer. A lot of people don't even realize what a green roof is, so coming here and seeing the the farm itself is a revelatory experience. It's just this really beautiful, awe-inspiring place. And Global Kids, when they came here, they were really moved by it. And I think very similar to a lot of the other uh, youth that come here, this is something that they want. Um, they want to see more of this uh, in their own communities. Green Roofs on Schools is really a, a compelling campaign. It would not only be really good for the kids, but just really good for the city in general. Our young people have created a, an online petition, they have paper petitions that they're getting signed currently and, and they have been getting signed throughout the year. Um, we're going to deliver that petition uh, to the school chancellor and the mayor to hopefully get this implemented in, in schools. I will be actively advocating for having a green roof on my school and I will be doing my share when time comes to create, build, help and run the program. While Global Kids has been helping young people advocate for green roofs, CUNY law professor Rebecca Bratsby's is reaching young people in yet another way, through the medium of comic books. My Zlot, I think, is the thing I am most proud of in my work to date. It is a way to help people understand, first of all, what environmental justice is and what environmental issues are, and also to understand the power that they have and the way that they can actually do something to change their world and to participate in decision making around environmental issues. It was really important to us to have the main character be a, a young girl and to be a person of color because environmental justice is about the fair treatment and meaningful participation of all people. Youth have a passion for fairness, they have a passion for justice, and they're looking for ways to express that. I want to be an environmental lawyer. And after I came here, I realized that um, I, I should actually help the environment with something that I enjoy doing. Not only will this whole like environmental issue affect me as like in this time period, but also afterwards, because if I actually want to take action, I would have to like be the best in what I do to actually uh, let's say not only talk to a principal of school, but actually talk to the president or vice president of a country. Journalist Yahi Genem fled Egypt under the threat of imprisonment, leaving his family behind. Now, he's part of the International Journalist in Residence program at the CUNY J School. Protecting journalism is protecting democracy. I think that journalists are very, very important. If they weren't so important, so many of them wouldn't be killed and incarcerated and, and threatened. I always thought that, okay, one of these times when I get tired of running like crazy, covering wars, maybe I'll end up doing something in the United States. But I never expected to be in the United States in such a situation. Yahya Ghanem, a very distinguished journalist, on Egyptian television, a regular commentator, simply wanted to train journalists to cover the elections. He never got a chance to do that. He was charged with receiving $3 million from the American government to indoctrinate journalists. This was the charge, which is absurd. And through that, they started the investigations and interrogations, and through that, the trial itself, they started changing the, uh, the indictment itself. You replace a, you know, one charge with another. They just fabricated the charges. They never thought about fabricating the evidence. I would have even showed more respect to them if, if they have taken the effort of fabricating the evidence. They put us in a cage like animals. I don't know why, and I don't know 
what is the wisdom behind starting the punishment before sentencing. He can't go back to his country. His son uh, was uh, attacked and both of his arms broken. He is financially uh, stranded. I believe if, uh, if I took a plane and landed back home in Egypt, I, I guess I'm going to be arrested and taken to jail immediately. His name is besmirched all over government-controlled media. It is an outrage what has happened to a man who simply wanted to train younger Egyptian journalists to cover news better. It was just inhuman. Inhuman. It was insulting, humiliating. And they did all that on purpose. I did train many journalists before. Actually, I was the, the first, I mean, with ICFJ in the year 2009 uh, to introduce the, what, what is called the citizen journalism in Egypt. So I trained the CJs, the citizen journalists, and I trained professional PJs, the professional journalists as well. So I know the importance of training, and especially training journalists in a country like Egypt. The, the ethical part of, of the profession, I believe, should be always there. Our program wants to bring journalists who cannot practice journalism in their countries for various reasons. Um, threat of prison, actual violence, expulsion from the country, basically for practicing journalism. Practicing the craft and the, and the art of journalism is their crime. This is our sixth year, and uh, they've come from Iraq, Iran, uh, Cameroon, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and now Egypt. Fortunately, I have to say that there's nothing poetic about what happened to me uh, during the last two years. There was a lot of agony and, and suffering, and uh, partially, I, I still don't know why, but, but, uh, but, you know, only recently and lately, I, I came to know some of the reasons why. The first worst thing that any dictatorship do is to, to corrupt media people, because Media could be the right hand of the devil and the right hand of God. So it depends uh, what kind of ruler you've got. What goes for me goes for my family. Uh, they suffer from the same mix of feelings, uh, anger, pain, disappointment, and frustration, and concern as well, because it is still going on. I hope that I would be able, if, if things didn't change, at least for me, back home, I hope that I would be able to bring them here and to start a new life here. I used to say that to my children, if you don't believe in miracles, you're not a realist. And uh, I'm a realist, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm very optimistic. UNICEF recently partnered with CUNY and challenged students to design solutions for child survival in developing countries. We learn a lot of stuff in school, but there's little room to kind of apply all those skills and make a, a worldly difference where you can really take your ideas and make it into reality and change other people's lives in the process. And for me, that's it's really gratifying to be part of this challenge because I get to get together with a bunch of friends, develop an idea which could theoretically have a really great impact on a lot of people. We originally had 45 student teams participating, uh, 23 submissions, um, and then three winners which were chosen. Creative Solutions is a team who proposed to tackle iron deficiency in pregnant women by appealing to their sweet tooth. Creative Solutions is tackling prenatal and infant malnutrition in Uganda. We think that a successful solution requires both an innovative product and an educational campaign. One of the main problems with prenatal care at the moment is the stigma of the Western medications that, that pregnant mothers aren't so keen about taking because of that. 
So we thought about what could we do to implement and take away the stigma, but still have that medication available. And we thought about candy, how everyone loves candy and would be willing to try it. CUNY will uh, finance the Creative Solutions team as well as the other winning teams to travel uh, to one of our select uh, country offices. Here they will have the opportunity to work with UNICEF field staff in an effort to test their prototypes, adapt them and further improve them. There are definitely going to be many challenges for our team uh, going forward. One of them is going to be to balance uh, the double-edged sword of this whole candy idea to make sure that we could implement it and test it without hurting anybody and to do it safely and effectively. We're hoping to really understand the culture and the women and those who will be treating through the use of a university and institutions in Uganda who really know the country well. Because we are, we're coming in as foreigners, as Westerners, but we want to relate to them on such a level that makes sense. We are wanting to incorporate the, the culture and the re real essence of the people that we are treating to make it as successful as possible. As Africa is rising, as, you know, as the current narrative goes, uh, it's, it's a great time to be there to witness it firsthand and to you know, bring our own sort of um, pro ideas for change in the region. I think we so often hear about older people that are changing the world, that are making a difference, and we always think, oh well, we need to complete our education or get a bunch of things behind our names before we are able to make a difference. But with this CUNY UNICEF challenge, it was brought to us now in our time of still studying and developing ourselves and who we are. And now we have the opportunity, it's now that we're able to go and implement the solution. Now we're able to go and change the world. UNICEF also selected two other teams as winners and their projects addressed water purification and maternal health. Thanks for watching Study with the Best. For more information on what you just saw, log on to our website at cuny.tv or you can Facebook and tweet us. See you next time. Bye. When I came to the, to the United States, I discovered that there are other people who were kidnapped around the world. I have always assumed that I was the only one. And I realized that there's an average of 200,000 children being abducted each year. And the stories that I, that I hear of survivors are mainly stories about how broken they are, how uh, damaged they are, how they can't trust, how they can't love. I want others to see that you can invest in children who were abducted. Just because they were abducted for so many years, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for them because they could come back and they could like have a passion to change the world.